So I'd like to introduce our panel today. Um, we've got Sumiyani Bhattacharya, Chair of the Center for Equity and Excellence in Teaching. And do you want me to say you're also an Associate Professor in English? I mean, I wear many hats. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Joseph Hardy, Director of Writing, uh, Center for Writing Across the Curricula. Mary Beth Stad, Executive Director of the Career Center. And Magali Arias Lopez. Yes, okay. Oh, I always just call her Magali, so <laughs> am I going to get it right? Um, and what's your official title? Uh, two titles STEM Center Coordinator. STEM Center Coordinator and? Success Coach. Success Coach. And our moderator. Aliyah Soini, Vice Provost for Academic Success. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, this is kind of an organic panel because you're going to kind of get to listen in on a conversation that we are actually having in real time. And so this is not pre prepared presentation. This is really um, a commitment that we are all making to try to approach our work in a different way, uh, really grounded in faculty staff collaboration with a specific eye on promoting student success. And the premise for this is really to sort of think about how we think about student success, student learning, what our goals are for students when they leave this place. And I think that for many of us who've been kind of on the hamster wheel since COVID and every cohort, they have different challenges, they have different um, quirks, they have different talents. And so we think we've all just sort of been feeling like we're keeping up with the students as best we can. Um, and so this has been an opportunity to reflect a little bit on what kind of new structures and approaches that we want to take. And so the panelists here today are all working on specific initiatives that really require them to engage in meaningful, substantive, long-term invested ways with faculty, staff, and students. And then that would maybe like help us to break out of our idea of students are here and classrooms are here, faculty and tutoring and career support, and like to, to figure out how these things really need to like work together. Um, so I'm gonna ask the panelists to introduce themselves and begin, but also to tell us a little bit about their role on campus and about an experience they've had collaborating with faculty and staff to support student success currently. You're currently with them. So I have a little bit of a cold, so I'm sorry if you can't hear me. I'm Mary Beth Stad. I'm the executive director of the Career Center. Um, right now, we're working on a project. It's a faculty learning community. It came out of a grant that we received from AACNU where they're looking to find models of um, instances and ways we can move from the curriculum into careers. So um, we have a group of us that are working together to partner to find ways that within the curriculum, within the classrooms, we can reach students and help them build skills, help them understand what skills they're, they're building, and how they can talk about them in a career um, setting. So for me, I think this is a great initiative because students don't always come to the career center or don't always think about their career, um, but they're in the classroom, they're in their classrooms with professors who can help guide them through this process. And I think if we can standardize and tell the faculty understand how to do this, and work together, I think that partnership could be invaluable for our students. Yeah, the line is on. Okay. There you go. Uh, so in my role as the director of the Center for Writing Across the Curriculum, which is really a uh, like a Venn diagram of student, faculty, and staff collaboration, um, I get to see from a variety of different perspectives. Um, but the one thing that I see is writers um, from those different perspectives, students who are writers, um, faculty who are writers. All of them are writing both their own research, but um, <laughs> they are all writers of prompts, of assignments, 
of emails, of announcements, of all kinds of things that go out to, to students and staff and other faculty. Um, and the, the staff who coordinate um, all of that, um, all of those interactions, who facilitate them and support them. Um, one sort of particular example uh, that I wanted to share here is um, the writing circles that we do, uh, the Core 200 um, uh, bridge labs that we do are uh, really, there's faculty involved, writing prompts, talking with me about those prompts, what the assignments, when they do, um, what do we want them to say and do. Uh, there's students who are reading the prompts um, with each other, trying to figure out what is this asking me to do, how are we doing this, how are we going to go about doing it. Um, there's staff who are running that center, scheduling these appointments with the students and the faculty, with each other, with me, um, uh, in this highly choreographed um, uh, and just really collaborative uh, space. It's a beautiful thing. Um, I get to see it every day. I'm really uh, lucky to be a part of it. So um, hi everyone, um, my name is Magali. I work in two office, two areas on campus. I'm a student success coach and I'm also a STEM center coordinator. Uh, something that I see within the two roles is I see kind of like a constant fear of students wanting to ask for help and realizing that they need help no matter the major they're in, no matter the situation. And I think there's always this fear that students have of being like judged or criticized. Um, so my role in, in both areas is how can I support the student? What are their needs? Um, there's moments where, I mean, we all have a pretty big workload and we're trying to see as many students as we can. Uh, and something I am still working on is remembering to reset with each student. Um, there's some students as a success coach who see me like every other week. And that's something they need to check in with assignments, to check in to see what support they're getting um, outside of class, like frequent the office hours. Um, is there extra resource that can help you with tutoring? And then I have more independent students who are like, great, I saw you once, perfect, I'll see you next month. Um, so the type of support students need varies. Um, as a STEM Center coordinator and STEM Center success coach, this is a really hard major. Like this is a major that involves a lot of students having to teach themselves. Uh, classes will teach them how to do step A and B, but then it's up for them to learn how to do step A, B, C, D, side to side, backwards, and maybe a little bit up here and there. Um, so one of the things I'm seeing is there's a resource where students can go and ask for help at STEM Center. So I help with hiring students who've already taken the class. Um, the tutoring we do is uh, venture-based tutoring. So the students are learning from another tutor student who's currently at SMC. Sometimes students are intimidated by my by me if I try to help them with psychology. They're like, okay, this person probably got straight A's. Da, 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 da. But um, it really helps students to connect with another student who took the class and lets them know this was a hard class for me. This is what I did to pass. This is how many times I went to office hours. Um, so STEM Center's purpose is we want to help any student um, who is struggling to get help and get the confidence and inspiration to continue with their studies in STEM. So the Marie, uh, Marie Curie STEM Center is one of the places I spent a lot of time in. Um, it was founded back in 2014. Goal was to help marginalized students from marginalized communities pursue a career in STEM. Um, before we started off with only tutoring like three or five classes, only introduction to chemistry, introduction to mathematics, and then an intro to physics. But now we tutor more than that. We have about 10 different subjects. We have a total of 24 different tutors. Um, you check our website, it's updated so students can see who's available. But I think one of the hardest challenges I get is how do you encourage a student to go and ask for help when you know they need help, but they don't want to verbally say, I'm struggling, what can I do to pass? Uh, and I think something when you're hearing students struggling, like the key issue is the timing. Like I tell my students, just because you go ask for tutoring doesn't mean you're silly, doesn't mean you're not smart enough. It just means you're double checking, you know, your materials. But right now what I see a lot of students is procrastinating and avoiding to get to that acknowledgement of like, I need help, if not, I'm going to fail my classes. And the students that come to me like three weeks before midterms, they're getting the help they need, they're doing better in their classes, 
of the students that don't come to me before and they come to me after midterms, they're most likely going to not pass the class or do well. Um, so those are some of the challenges and the gaps we're trying to build. STEM Center started group tutoring. So we have one assigned tutor to work with a group of students doing general chemistry, um, let's say computer, uh, computer science, CS22. So there's a designated person for that group. Um, for STEM, you do have to study by yourself, but you have to study in groups and then practice what you learn to teach another peer. Um, but that's a concept that a lot of students are still struggling to take advantage of and realize that they need to do that. Um, there's more to come. We're trying to do collaborations with Craft or New. We're trying to show students that Staff Center, besides just being studying, it's also a communal space that's safe. Um, amongst all the 24 tutors, there's really good autonomy. Everybody supports one another. These students are more than happy to give advice and mentor other students if they'd like it. Um, and then another collaboration we're trying to do is STEM Center uh, Living and Learning Community Mentors. So these are also other students who have office hours, uh, 7 to uh, 9 p.m. And a lot of students are not going to ask for help. They're just not using the resource. So my big question is like, how do I get them to go on free will, not by force? Anyways, <laughs> that's the big question as of right now. Um, and we've done like, uh, sorry, I'll stop after this. We've done an event where we brought an alumni tutor from STEM Center. Their name is Daniel, a wonderful tutor back a couple years ago. Um, a lot of our students are struggling with like the basic concepts of algebraic mathematics. So we did some math refresher sessions where they started from the ground up. Uh, Dr. Karen Ruth was the one who worked maybe with Daniel and this was a wonderful refresher. We're hoping to do more things like that in the future, but it does take a lot of where are our students at? What do they need? Maybe the traditional form of tutoring support we offer, it's not working. So what other supplements can we provide as a STEM center? So, yeah. okay, I'll stop now. Pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Magali. Um, my name is Sriani. I am the center for, uh, I am the center. Yeah, which is, <laughs> it's not true. true. That, it's I kind of funny. Yeah, because I am. Uh, I'm the chair for uh, the Center for Equity and Excellence in Teaching, but I'm also um, uh, an associate professor in English, so I kind of get to see both sides, uh, as it were, um, and uh, I get to see a lot of first-year writers uh, because I teach, um, you know, what is now uh, English one already one on one uh, two on one. Um, and so it's kind of uh, my role as I see it is to think about both teaching in the classroom and see the behind the scenes as it were uh, at the center. So um, one of the things that uh, we piloted last year and I think the faculty learning community that you mentioned that uh, Mary Beth is part of that as well is to gather faculty and staff to sort of kind of come together and create a sandbox where you can um, think through teaching and learning as sort of problems and find creative solutions. Um, so the one that um, Kiko and I and then Alia, uh, you were part of the, that as well, that we started last year was thinking about how do you encourage humanities students to see their, their skills as practical, as applicable as not just, you know, I read a book, I write a novel, I write a story, I you know, read a history text. Um, so um, we had two really great classes come out of that faculty learning community. So uh, Professor Jason Chikaitis' um, course on uh, video essays. So he took one essay that the student had written in a traditional format and taught students how to translate that into uh, the video format. Um, and then um, Cole Brown taught a radical imaginations lab in gen term and had a one credit lab, uh, I think in spring. So essentially sort of, you know, being really creative with uh, different learning approaches, thinking about what faculty need to do to address the, the questions that you're bringing up. It's sort of not just meeting students where they are, but also trying to sort of understand where we think we are meeting them, but we are not quite getting to. Uh, so just to give you an example, I have writing circles in my classes and I encourage students to give feedback to each other, read each other's work in the very, very detailed rubrics to sort of, you know, go beyond this funny phase and, you know, you did good A+. Plus. Uh, but increasingly I'm finding that even with very strong writers, they're struggling to understand where the argument is, what is evidence, what counts as 
information with council sources, right? So it's not just enough then to give um, a student a rubric, but to walk through what I understand to be, uh, to be the meaning of these terms and, and see where they're at, and then come to an understanding that makes sense to both of us. Um, so essentially, a lot of hard work that I think the students are putting in, um, and they are trying to get to the point where they're comfortable asking for help. Um, but I agree that we need to do more um, on that front. But anyway, the faculty learning community is is fascinating. Uh, we have three running this year, uh, Mary Beth's um, on career to curriculum, uh, the NEH one that's uh, on humanities and practice, and then there's a third one on seminar um, and kind of thinking through teaching in seminar. Um, and the hope is next year we will have another one and you know this is hint hint nudge nudge on AI and if you know you have some other ideas that would be fabulous. Um, yeah. So I have just a little bit of follow up because you all sort of pointed to this but just for the sake of our audience we need these topics. So some of the things that have come out of these learning communities and workshops and things like that are also um, bringing staff into the classroom. Right? There's a humanities practice, the, the museum, Britt and John are both teaching museum practice courses um, where students get to do hands on humanities art practice in the museum. Uh, Mary Beth is teaching their quarter match series and courses. Um, the writing circles that Joe mentioned, right? So I think it's interesting. I don't know if anybody has anything to add to that, but there's a little bit more permeability between the, the class and the, what we might think of as kind of like tutoring support or um, student support services. I think one thing about um, the classroom is it gives space for the students. So when I think about students having time, um, and, you know, touching a little bit on what colleague was saying, I think that there are so many competing interests. So if a student has a paper due next week or they have a test due, it's difficult, you know, something like um, career exploration or applying for internships or things like that, that's something can, that can maybe fall off the list. And I think it's helpful for students to have time to really focus on things that are of interest to them or should be of interest to them. But that's what I've found um, being in the classroom. And for me, it's also great because you get to know them so much better. I think they feel more comfortable and it just kind of opens that dialogue where meeting with someone for a half hour is maybe a little more difficult to do. Kind of like to echo off of what you're saying, Mary Beth, something that we try to do at STEM Center is have like how to study events um, for X class and then invite the professor or faculty member to come over and just kind of like listen to the advice we're giving, listen to the tutoring style of our tutor. Um, but I am also aware that there's only so much you can stretch staff and faculty. So there's a limit to how much you can offer in your services and help to students. So um, something that is a project coming up, I'm trying to ask you know, the current tutors on their free time to can you share your study guides? Can you share whatever study um, techniques you used and kind of like creating an extra resource drive for students? Um, but something that helps students want to go back to a space is when um, students see the faculty or member or professor, not just being a professor, but also in the spaces with them. Uh, I say that from personal experience because I'm also an RD, so I'm on campus like 24-7. Um, but the likelihood of a student telling me, look, oh, I'm not doing well, I'm failing my classes, it's higher the more I see them around campus. So just the other day, I saw two students, and I was just saying hi, and they immediately told me how they were doing in their classes. Um, and we got them tutoring, and they're feeling much more confident, they're doing better. Three, two weeks ago, they're ready to drop the class, and it's just, I don't know, it just depends on how comfortable they feel with you as well as a staff member or a professor. Um, and I noticed the students that don't live in my home, they've never seen me, they're like, who is this stranger? I don't even want to talk to you. I don't really trust you yet. And I don't blame them. So um, it's kind of thinking of how can you make communal events where people can go, faculty and staff, and then how can students see how you interact with each other as support systems? 
and then they feel more comfortable with our interactions, they're more likely to come and ask us for help because they know a lot of these people are really informative. They have a lot of information, but again, it's all about the time and planning and people's availability. Well, sir, um, just to follow up on the Lee's reference of wedding circles, um, the, the three sort of legs of a of a stool. I mean, I'm thinking about like Sarah's uh, accounting communication students um, will be writing resumes or personal statements. Um, then they'll pass through the career center, get a sense of like, okay, well, what should this be? They'll get an assignment from Sarah. They'll pass through the career center, get a sense of like, oh, what should this be doing or saying? Then they'll end up in in quack and feedback on what is this actually doing or saying and then the back and stairs class and this like uh, not ping ponging uh, but like pinballing around all uh, between faculty and students and staff all sort of contributing to the writing project um, and the same kind of thing with kinesiology um, students in addison pond's kines 300 class will uh, be getting assignments from him they'll end up in the library talking with uh, Sarah, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everything. Um, talking to Sarah about uh, what needs to be in their literature reviews. Uh, then we'll be back in Quack in writing service, getting feedback on like what is actually coming across here. And then back in Addison's class, and it's yeah, again, just ping ponging around, ping ping balling around um, this one writing project, getting all these perspectives and um, contributions to it. Uh, school but, yeah, and kind of echoing um, what everyone here is saying, I think one of the things that came out of the faculty learning community last year on humanities and practice is that a lot of what we are doing uh, in terms of teaching is sort of very, sort of, especially the way of thinking about it in terms of practice, has to be kind of oriented towards industry and oriented kind of outside the campus. So um, I think something that we all talked about was how do you get students comfortable talking to different stakeholders on campus? Because we get used to it as professionals, but we never think about transmitting that, stu uh, that part of the knowledge to students. Um, so, you know, how do you have someone who is, say, in my, you know, theory class who's also at the museum, and I'm thinking about uh, Desiree in particular, you know, who is performing at the museum, but bringing that performance into the class and then kind of you know, thinking about it and talking about it with her fellow students um, and how to sort of make this more institutionalized rather than relying on individual students who are good at doing it. Um, but yeah, I think that's where the conversation's at. To go a little bit off, I always tell students, um, be curious, like, be super curious, be super nosy. I try to tell them, try to learn about the stories of the people around you, because a lot of times your students are like, I don't know what I really want to do. I'm a STEM major or I'm an art history major. Like, I'm really lost. I'm like, the answers might be right in front of you. So I tell the students, just do a lot of digging. You don't you have to do a lot of research for yourself. I don't think it's something that could be taught more in like, a class or if it could be done like as an outside event. But a lot of students will look at us as staff members or faculty members, like you have all the answers, can you help me and just give me an answer so I can, can get to the end of the problem? I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. Um, something I see too with students that helps that curiosity is when professors and faculty are willing to share their story. Um, tell them how you got to what you're doing. Uh, let them know if this was actually your topic because uh, a lot of students think that there's like a linear route to an end career goal. And I was telling my students, um, you might have one job career one day and then it can just change in the next. I use myself as an example because I've gone through three different job careers uh, in less than six years. Anyways, um, sometimes that's a type of reality talk that students need to. Um, and sometimes you have to let students know like maybe you didn't pick your jobs, maybe your jobs found you. But students have this idea of what I study is what I have to work in and that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And then I tell students, I still don't even know what I'm going to do in 10 years. And they look at me like, I'm like, oh my God, you're an adult. You should know what you're doing. But I tell students that's one of the beauties of college. Like, it's a chance to explore. It's a chance to see what potential avenues you can go into. Um, but 
is just encouraging students to just start talking, just ask questions. All right, so those are some really good examples of well coordinated um, positive interactions and positive um, impacts. Um, but from your work, what else have you learned about how students learn or what obstacles are to students learning that you might also um, kind of open up a, a safe space to ask each other for help or to collaborate? Like, what are things that maybe haven't gone so well in trying to intervene in these ways to help students to get where they want to be going. Well, um, co-locating as Quack does with uh, the Tutoring and Academic Skills Center in De La Salle uh, and uh, me being the director of the of Quack, I'm the fly on the wall for a lot of uh, conversations that students have with each other. One-on-one um, -on -one, uh, in, in Quack sessions or in uh, task sessions or in, in small groups. Uh, and there's a lot of learning that happens in this collaborative conversation space uh, that uh, you can imagine a tutoring session uh, for biology or accounting, and someone's in a, in a, in a class and, and they're hearing a professor tell them how to do this balance this equation or figure this out or whatever it is. Um, and, and that's just not landing in that space um, entirely. Um, and so they'll, they'll come to work, come to, to task, to sit down with uh, a peer in a very low stakes uh, environment and just have a conversation and be vulnerable and say, I don't, I don't understand this. Or, not sure I get it, um, and just have a conversation with a peer, uh, and that opens up, um, opens them up, it opens the, the issue or the topic up in just surprising and unexpected ways. It's, it's a microcosm of what happens in, in, in the seminar classroom on a larger scale, uh, but it's the same kind of thing as the social construction of knowledge in, in, in discussion. I mean, something that I've seen happening over the course of, especially post-COVID, but perhaps even prior to that, is a sh very sharp distinction in um, how students approach careers in their first years, as opposed to their sort of like kind of getting close to graduation. Uh, so one of the things that I start to do with them, uh, whether it's a writing class by a class or if I'm seeing freshmen, um, is to tell them, okay, what lines do you want on your CV? What does it matter? What does it mean? Um, and for most students, those are just words that put quiz and computer. Does this have a bearing on my grade? Um, but you know, then you see them scrambling to get those lines on their CVs two, three years down the line. Um, and so something that I've started to do, and you know, um, Again, drawing on Sarah because <laughs> you're in the line of sight. Uh, but no, uh, so I'm teaching a class on digital humanities, for example, where I'm trying to teach them very specific tools. Um, and I've taught the same thing in the past, but I've never really done it this way, but I'm being very intentional about this is where it goes on your CV. If you're doing a resume, it goes here. If you're doing an academic CV, it goes here. Um, and often it's kind of, you know, it falls flat because they don't have everything else um, in there. But I keep talking about it every few weeks until um, they think I'm a broken record. But my hope is that for some of these students, at least they will land, that they need to be thinking about the skills that they're learning in the classroom as having very real bearings on the world outside. That you know they can talk about some of the lines that they have, some of the things that they have on their resume with their academic advisors, with their success coaches as they're looking for internships that they shouldn't be waiting till you're three to start looking for internships if their major doesn't push, push them already, right? So it's just this it's very concentrated over and over and over again. Some classes lend themselves better to this than the other, um, but they are still very much reluctant in their first year or so to think of the world beyond the classroom. And I can see why, you know, they've made such a great transition. They're in the classroom, you want to think about life after. Um, but yeah, starting early, I think. I think um, exactly what you're say, saying is what's important to us right now in the Career Center when we're thinking about students. What we see that, you know, in some ways is somewhat heartbreaking is when we meet seniors 
we've done none of that work. And um, it goes fast, right? Therefore, their time goes fast. And I think the difficulty is many of them, kind of to Magali's point, they don't know, so they don't want to think about it, right? So they're hoping that someday it will just come to them. Um, and that's why we're trying to do the work to show them along the way, places that they can start thinking about things. So we met yesterday or the day before about FIAP courses, and we really want to focus on the process of career exploration. That it just doesn't happen. You know, you can be intentional about your career. You can be intentional about your experiences. Um, I have a simple thing that I never like to ask a student what you want to do because it feels so permanent and it feels so, if I'm wrong, then I've failed. Whereas if we talk about, and I ask a student, what might you want to try first? They usually have an idea and it seems low risk, right? Because you tried it, you find some information out, you can have a nice pivot from that. The hard part is some students are more inclined and driven to maybe seek this out and they'll come to us and say, I'm studying this and I'm not sure about this. And the students we really want to reach are those that either um, are afraid to ask, don't know where to ask, aren't used to asking. Um, maybe it's too far out of their comfort zone. So in a classroom, if someone's kind of nudging them those questions, um, it becomes easier for them because they know it's the right thing to be asking. And that's why partnerships between faculty and staff are so important because sometimes a student will open up to Magali or Joe or me or Sabinani. You never know, but we want them to open up to someone. Um, I just kind of want to add on uh, to Mary Beth. I definitely was that senior who did not make into internships or what career I wanted to do. Um, but at the time, when I think back to myself as a, a STEM student, I was just struggling to pass my classes. So the goal was, let's just graduate, let's just get the BA or BS, and then take whichever work opportunity comes. And that was for myself as a first-generation college student. And then it was just, um, let's take care of one fire at a time. Um, that's how my brain was back as a student. Um, now that I think about like my STEM students at STEM Center, I think one of the biggest challenges we face is our tutors know how to teach. They can also watch a video with a student and guide them through the steps. But sometimes there's a disconnect where our tutors maybe didn't have the same professor as a student. So then our tutor has to do like extra labor work, try to figure out and see the notes of the student. Um, and then kind of like another challenge that is added to STEM Center tutoring is a lot, of our, a lot of our students haven't done their reading before. They haven't done any practice problems and they want instant uh, gratification. Like they want instant help. I want to learn this now. My exam is in Friday. Like let's learn as much as I can. And something I tell my tutors to remind all the students, like you have to do the legwork yourself. Um, as a STEM major, I think it's all about the mindset. Um, if you're going into a STEM career, you have to enjoy doing practice problems. You have to be very vocal about when you're stuck and when you need help because professors can't read your mind. Neither can the tutors. So it's kind of, I guess, one of the challenges is, yes, we have tutors. They're able to help to a certain extent, but they're also limited because they don't have the same knowledge as the professors. So the way we're trying to connect this gap is have this study for biology, have this study for chemistry, um, but that will add on extra work to both the tutor and the faculty member. Um, another challenge I'm seeing in STEM Center and with STEM success coaching is a lot of students come from households where they think of only two successful careers. That would be a doctor or a lawyer. And a lot of the times we never know what background students come from. Um, if they're first generation or we don't know what type of education the parents or family has. So then we don't know where the knowledge is coming from that's being put on to students. So um, something that we're trying to do to expand students' minds and be more open-minded is having panels of different alumni, students, and STEM. Recently, we've only been successful in doing Zoom videos because not everybody can come to FMP <laughs> and share their story. Um, we also try to encourage students to go to events um, planned by the Career Center, like 
Marie that post on how to apply for med school, um, what are some things students can do. So there's a lot of opportunities for students to get more ideas and inspiration. Um, now the hard part is sometimes taking our STEM students away from just studying and academics. So um, STEM students experience a lot of burnout. And I think the big question is, how do we help combat the burnout? Like how do we balance the burnout versus academics, personal, and then seeking different career opportunities like Mary Beth just said. Um, but those are some of the challenges we face. And in, in, in all areas, if a student doesn't want help, you can't force them to get help. So that's like the number one big question. Like how do you encourage a student to self-advocate? Or how do you teach a student to self-advocate like I said earlier? So we have one more question that we can think about for a couple of seconds and kind of distilled for us. Um, if there was one or two things you know, for all of us in the audience here as faculty and staff at SMC could do to um, positively impact the work that you're doing in your area or um, to help to improve student learning and their experiences of learning and their preparation um, for life beyond the same year. What, what can we all do to sort of support that process? Um, I think, you know, certainly when I talk to employers, I think uh, especially post-COVID, the part and uh, that students seem to check and uh, struggle with the most is their communication skills. So their ability to go up to an employer, to talk to a client, to work with coworkers. So anything that encourages them I know they'll just say they don't like this, but group projects where they have to work with other people. Um, one, it teaches them how to work with other people, and two, it gives them things to talk about on their resume and their interviews. But um, I was watching at the last few career fairs that we had, and I spoke to different employers. The students that were able to go up and have a conversation with someone they didn't know, an employer, were successful. But I've really seen a drop in students' ability to be able to do that. So, and I hear a lot of writing skills. I mean, students send me emails sometimes, and we talk about it a lot in class. It's just, I think, a, a, I don't know, I, I feel like a lot of it comes from texting, that, you know, that it's too informal, they don't understand the differences. Um, but definitely the ability to communicate their ideas to someone and have the confidence to go to speak to someone that's so important right now in any way you can enforce that um, reinforce that teach that stress that and group projects I think are really helpful. I don't agree with all of that um, but uh, touch on a point that I think Dal raised um, uh, and that Mary Beth raised like there's students who are really proactive about their resumes and their careers and, and, and really thinking about that um, early on. Um, and there's students who come into the STEM center before they have a problem, um, not as a, 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 a kind of a remedial space. Um, I think one, uh, the same thing uh, applies to, to Quack and to Task, and that is uh, we're here for everyone, but um, not everyone knows that. Um, a lot of uh, students will think of Quack as a remedial space for bad writers. Uh, or they'll think of STEM as a place that you go if you have a problem that you need to solve. Uh, or they'll think of uh, careers as uh, some place that you go uh, uh, when you need a job rather than think about uh, the one you might want to get. Uh, that's the way I uh, talk about Quack. I say, you know, Quack is a space for writers. If you, if you think of yourself as a good writer, come to Quack and be a better one. If you don't think of yourself as a good writer, come to Quack and be a better one. Um, it, it, I think so that's one thing that I would uh, encourage everyone to, to, to think and talk about as these resources are not, they're for, they're for writers and they're for uh, people who might have careers and they're for people who work in STEM. Um, whether they, they think of themselves as particularly talented or strong or not, um, there are spaces for those, um, for those people to come and do that thing. Uh, but also, yeah, group work, uh, uh, and communication skills. Uh, and I'm gonna maybe so I'd like to say something like you can study accounting anywhere, and we have an accounting class here, or 
our program here. This is not a knock on the accounting program. Um, but what you get here in a place like this that you don't get in other places that have accounting programs uh, is the, the practice, the experience of communicating in small groups and learning how to talk about discipline in a small group, how to write about it. Um, uh, that's what you're coming here to get. That's what you're leading with. Uh, I think we should communicate that. Um, yeah, thank you. For um, STEM Center, even though it's like a science space, it's also open to all students. It's open um, every day, um, Monday through Friday, even on weekends. So students just need to find a place to study, they can go. <laughs> um, the times when the tutoring support is there is Monday through Thursday, 1 to 8 p.m., and Sunday, 6 to 8. So encourage your students to just check it out, go see the study space. They don't actually have to ask for help. Um, we also try to give like free snacks to students because we know um, some students are on a budget to be here. So we're not going to be like, oh no, you can't take one because you're not a STEM major. No, everyone's going to use the space and the services. Um, we even have some books there for when students go seek tutoring. Um, we have some groups of students that maybe they can't afford to have every single STEM book. So, Stem Center wants to spend the money, have the book there, and then students can use it at their leisure. Um, I think um, one of the things I've noticed and that works for me as a STEM success coach and a staff member is when I connect to one student, students are very good at like communicating with other people. So if one student likes you and likes the way you work with them, they're more than likely to tell all their buddies and friends and the next thing you know, you have a line of like 15 students outside of your office. Um, so any connections you have with students, you can also ask them um, when finding them, having this event, like, what do you think? Is this something that would interest you? So sometimes myself as a, a coordinator or a success coach, I'm thinking this and this would be really good for the students. But sometimes it helps to ask the students, is this something that you think will benefit you? Is this something that would be beneficial? Because um, I, I can tell you, we've tried planning movie nights, we've tried planning other social gatherings, but it's just not interesting to the students. So um, if you're not sure what your population wants or needs, just ask them and then make plans from there is all I can say. Um, kind of echoing what everyone has said here, I think uh, as some faculty, we need to do, in my mind, two things. One, um, in every space we get, Nella is asking for help, whether it's by modeling, um, it's by encouraging, whether it's by mandating, I don't know, in, in various ways, um, sort of, you know, telling people, telling students that not only is it okay to ask for help, it's as important as passing your classes, as showing up, as, you know, just being there in class. Um, and the other thing is to um, work with students in, um, on time management, because every year, one of the things that I've seen consistently on student feedback or student evaluation feedback um, they would get at the end of the courses is they will talk about, I didn't have time enough to study. I wish I had time uh, to study. I didn't manage my time well. I wish I had spoken to the professor sooner. Um, and I think they get some of that in, uh, in FIAC where you know we work with them to do time management. But after that, it seems to fall off. Um, so kind of reinforcing, um, are you sleeping? <laughs> Um, do you have a social life? Because sometimes you won't. And kind of you know, helping them manage that expectation that towards midterms, towards finals, you're not going to have time. It's going to feel restricting. And it'll let up at the end, right? So the, the cycle of the academic year, I think, is something that they're not sort of used to, unlike us who, you know, I say that I've been in school for, I don't know, since my, since forever. Anyway, um, uh, so just sort of, both of those, right? Telling them that it's okay to ask for help and telling them that you're not going to, you know, sort of look silly if you sort of fall off managing time once, but it's going to eventually benefit you if you can make that a habit. But you know your priorities best. It's also time management. So I was just going to say, too, I noticed faculty and professors, maybe you all don't have the time. So sit with a student for 30 minutes. Um, you can always direct them to the success coaches. Um, work with students on scheduling, building a routine. 
I can tell you half of the students I've met don't have a routine built on an Excel sheet. They don't know what time they normally study. And a lot of the students come from high schools where everything was pre planned for them. And they're really struggling to learn how to study, learn how to use their free time, learn how to manage their dinner and lunch. Like these are simple things that we all got to handle easily, well for me easily, but for some students it becomes harder because there's no one there to remind them of the things they have to do. So if you don't have time um, to go over the whole routine from breakfast to dinner and the time you go to sleep, uh, encourage them to visit their success coach, any success coach. Right, so let's leave more time for some questions. I think I'm time for maybe one. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Jeff Sigmund. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> so for the do you have data on the students who have had quack incorporated as part of a class? Are they more likely then to follow up with utilizing your resource later? Good question. Do we have so if I'm hearing you right, um, the, the question is kind of like if we. Are you addicted? Yes. <laughs> we get them the longer they come back. Um, I don't think we have data on. I mean, we have. We could have that data. I don't know that I can um, uh, recount it here for you. What I can say is that um, the students who engage with Quack of their own accord. Um, see the same benefits as the students who are compelled to engage with Quack. <laughs> um, which uh, greater minds than mine tell me suggests that there's, but doesn't, doesn't necessarily eliminate the possibility of selection bias, but it sort of undermines it, um, which suggests that it's the, uh, the treatment is actually working and it's not just um, the students with the high GPAs or the, the successful ones who end up in space. It's they end up with higher GPAs and greater graduation rates and so on because they reach the space. I'm not that really speaks to that, but that's the data that I have. I think we used our time, but I'm sure our panelists would be happy to continue the conversation if any of you is meeting all look for more ways to work together supporting students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.